The theological roots of Rastafari can be credited to the independent preachers Leonard Percival Howell, Robert Hines, Archibald Dunkley, and Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert. They first asserted that Rastafari Makoen, the newly crowned emperor of Ethiopia who took the name Haile Selassie I, was God in the early 1930s. In addition to Haile Selassie's divinity, these four men preached about black pride, black freedom, and the return of the black diaspora to Africa. These Rasta pioneers, like most of the first preachers influenced by Ethiopianism and Pan-Africanism, felt more comfortable addressing the masses of people in the streets rather than delivering ceremonious speeches in their churches. Nevertheless, they all had their own congregations that they ruled over with charismatic authority. Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert was born in Jamaica in 1894. His adopted father took him to Costa Rica in 1911. In Costa Rica, Hibbert leased 28 acres of land where he grew bananas. In 1924, he joined the Ancient Mystic Order of Ethiopia, a Masonic society whose constitution was revised in 1888 and incorporated in 1928 in Panama. Hibbert became a master mason of this order. When he returned to Jamaica, he began to preach at Benoa District, St. Andrew, about Haile Selassie as the King of Kings, the returned Messiah, and the Redeemer of Israel. From there, he moved to Kingston to find Leonard Howell already preaching Rastafari as God at the Redemption Market. Henry Archibald Dunkley is another man who may claim to have brought the Rastafari doctrine to Jamaica. Archibald Dunkley was a Jamaican seaman on the Atlantic Fruit Company's boats. He quit the sea on December 8, 1930, when he landed at Port Antonio off the SS St. Mary. Coming to Kingston, Dunkley studied the Bible for two and a half years on his own to determine whether Haile Selassie was the Messiah Garvey had prophesied. Ezekiel 30, 1 Timothy 6, Revelation 17 and 19 and Isaiah 43 finally convinced him. In 1933, Dunkley opened his mission, preaching Rastafari as the King of Kings, the Root of David, the Son of the Living God, but not the Father himself. Dunkley was arrested several times in 1934-35 and eventually spent six months in an asylum. A former follower of Alexander Bedward, Robert Hines was another early preacher who preached about the divinity of Emperor Haile Selassie. His inspiration reached the slum area of Kingston known as the Dungal, or Dunghill, where another group was forming. Paul Eddington, Vernal Davis, Ferdinand Ricketts, and others discussed Marcus Garvey's doctrines and the Jamaican social conditions. This group focused on social reform in Jamaica and migration to Africa. Garvey's statements that when a king is crowned in Africa, the time is near gave credence to the doctrines taught by Howell, Hibbert, and Dunkley independently. In 1934, inspired by Robert Hines, this group acknowledged Haile Selassie as the living God. August 25, 1937, in New York City, the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, EWF, was established. The primary purpose was set out in the following preamble. We the black people of the world, in order to effect unity, solidarity, liberty, freedom, and self-determination, to secure justice and maintain the integrity of Ethiopia, which is our divine heritage, do hereby establish and ordain this constitution for the Ethiopian World Federation, Incorporated. This constitution and bylaws are a detailed and businesslike document. The first local branch was established in New York by Dr. Malaku Bayan in 1937. The first local to be established in Jamaica was Local 17, which Paul Ellington set up in August 1938 with Archibald Dunkley and Nathaniel Hibbert. Through the EWF, they tried to reunite all of Jamaica's various Ethiopianist groups. This task failed, and Local 17 eventually dissolved due to personality conflicts and doctrinal schisms. Although these early Rastafari missions originated and developed independently, one man stood out more than the rest. He played a critical role in developing the Rastafari religion with his pinnacle community. <music> Leonard Percival Howell was born on June 16, 1898 in Redlands, Clarendon, Jamaica. He is considered the first Rasta and suffered greatly for the movement's founding. At the age of 14, Howell moved to New York. His father wanted him to be a doctor, but young Leonard said he couldn't handle chemistry. 
his father abandoned him and cut off his allowance. Leonard went from job to job until he met an American army colonel named Aits. Leonard traveled across the globe with Aits, from Asia to Europe. He made several visits to Panama, where there was a significant intermixture of ideas and nationalities working there at different times. Howell was exposed to Pan-Africanism, Marxism, Communism, and various forms of black nationalism during this time. He joined the Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded in 1914 by fellow Jamaican Marcus Garvey. Although Garvey's ideas influenced Howell's thinking, Howell had a mixed relationship with Garvey, a Christian who later criticized the budding Rastafari movement as a cult. His ideas about the Rasta came into being while he was abroad. In 1929, Howell settled in Harlem during an upsurge of Garveyism and Marxism. He opened a team room on 136th Street, a famous haven for preachers and radicals and a stronghold for the Universal Negro Improvement Association. That Universal Negro Improvement Association didn't like what Howell was doing there and reported him to the police. It's possible the team room was actually a ganga den. A member of the UNIA claimed Howell was indulging in nefarious practices and even accused him of being an Obia man. After his application for U.S. citizenship was denied, Leonard returned to Jamaica in November 1932. He was appalled at the standard of living of the black people. At this point, it was 104 years since slavery ended and there was still no relief for many black people. They were penniless and abandoned by the governing British. It had been two years since Haile Selassie was crowned emperor of Ethiopia. Howell began spreading the Rastafarian message across the island. He combined what he had learned abroad with local knowledge. He proclaimed that the black race was superior and that Haile Selassie I was the returning messiah. According to reports, he sold 5,000 pictures of Selassie for one shilling each to finance his mission. He also made money by treating sick people who came to him for miracle cures. He became friends with Marcus Garvey, who had been deported from America five years earlier. The friendship didn't last long as the Kingston UNIA convention denounced all new cults that were entirely contradictory to the set principles of true religion. When Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert heard Howell at a street meeting in Kingston in 1932, he asked to speak on his platform. After that, Howell asked Hibbert to help him in Kingston as he was going to preach at Port Morant. Howell, at that time, had no formal constitution or rules concerning his mission. During Howell's time at St. Thomas Parish, Hibbert organized Howell's followers into a group called the Ethiopian Coptic Faith, one with a clear organization, procedure, and rules. Upon his return from St. Thomas, Howell disassociated himself from this order, leaving Hibbert to continue the order alone. Hibbert continued preaching. Henry Archibald Dunkley, whose ideas had much in common with his, spoke on Hibbert's platform occasionally. With his mystical orientation and Masonic discipline, Hibbert proceeded to develop the Ethiopian Coptic Church on orderly lines and, for this purpose, had certain extracts from the Ethiopic Bible of St. Thomas printed at his own expense for the instruction of his followers. Dunkley, who lacked this background, continued to base his teaching on the King James Version of the Bible. Howell's worldliness and talent as a speaker attracted Jamaica's underclass and the attention of the local authorities, who dubbed him a cult leader. The colonial police had identified the attendees at Howell's meetings as the poor and ignorant who have nothing else to do. Leonard Howell introduced the idea and movement of Rastafari to Trinityville, St. Thomas, Indiana, April 1933. His efforts to unite the ex-slaves across the plantation led to violence and police harassment. His first sermon was followed by calls to arrest him for sedition. The planter class, the church, and the police conspired against Howell. During his speeches, he warned his followers against the wrong doctrine of the church, the oppressive nature of the state, and that the British monarch was no longer their king. While walking across the plantation of St. Thomas, he openly denounced the planters and the church. He was vilified for preaching the good news of a new king and messiah for black people. His speeches cemented his status as a national political subvert. In September 1933, Howell held a meeting and invited the police to attend as he knew they were spying on him. 
At the meeting, he talked about slavery, how the white man stole Africa from the Africans, and that black people should think of Africa as their home, not Jamaica. On October 8th, he held a meeting at Port Morant, where he preached against the clergy. He called them thieves and robbers and said they should be driven out of the churches and the churches should be locked for good. He preached that white men were rascals and scoundrels who were robbing the people and keeping them down. He told his followers that they could live independently without the white men. He spoke out against the wrongs of the crown and colonial Jamaica against the men, women, and children of Africa stolen, sold, and enslaved in Jamaica for hundreds of years. Throughout October, he held meetings abusing the church and clergy. The church finally retaliated by making a complaint to the police inspector. In March 1934, Howell was arrested for sedition along with Hines and two of their followers. This trial began on March 13th at Morant Bay Courthouse, where Paul Bogle had been tried and executed in 1865. The Daily Gleaner newspaper reporting of the trial helped make Howell a martyr and introduced literate Jamaicans to the theories of Rastafari. Howell was sentenced to two years imprisonment. He spent the time writing The Promised Key, a treatise on religion and the history of the black diaspora. The text combined writings from the Royal Parchment Scroll of Black Supremacy written by Fitz Ballantine Petersburg, an early Rasta forerunner, and the Holy Piety written by Robert Athley Rogers. Besides arresting Howell and Hines, the police charged Henry Archibald Dunkley with disorderly conduct in September 1934. He was sent to jail for 30 days. On February 20, 1935, he was placed in the halfway tree lockup before being removed to the asylum, where he remained for five months. Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert was also arrested in 1935, once in Port Morant and twice in Kingston. He was fined 30 shillings for disorderly conduct during his arrest on a charge of lunacy. The establishment seemed to use arrests and charges of sedition or lunacy to suppress the movement. Most leaders had been arrested, tried, and sentenced to long periods behind bars or treatment in Kingston's mental hospital. Released from prison in 1936, Howell published a newspaper called The People's Voice and assumed this new name, Gong Guru or Gong for short. He was known by this name until the 1960s. Howell was arrested several more times for his teachings. In February 1938, he was sent to Bellevue Mental Hospital. When he was released from Bellevue, Howell founded the Ethiopian Salvation Society in November 1940 on a property of around 400 acres he called Pinnacle. The property was hidden in the hills of St. Catherine, five miles from Sligoville, and was only accessible on foot. Rasta communities were born at Pinnacle when hundreds of men, women, and children, known then as Rastafarites, found refuge there. The Rastas lived in peace based on their interpretation of the Bible. It was a self-sufficient community that raised cattle and grew crops. The Rastafarians also took part in recreational activities such as playing kumina drums. Holwell served as the supreme chief and was said to enforce a lot of discipline within the community. Pinnacle relied partly on the sale and cultivation of marijuana. This holy herb had become the focal point of all their rituals. Rastas developed the practice of smoking ganga at Pinnacle. Government forces swooped down on Pinnacle in 1941 and arrested many of Howell's followers. Howell fled but was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison for sedition on August 20th. Upon his release in 1943, he returned to Pinnacle. For almost a decade following his return, Pinnacle flourished as the residents were left alone to get on with their lives. A lot of their income came from trading and farming. People saw Pinnacle as a place where they could prosper on their own. This led to an increase in population. However, it was not to last. The police raided Pinnacle several more times in the 1950s. A government militia eventually destroyed Pinnacle in 1954, evicting the residents. Those who remained reassembled at nearby Tredegar Park and Cross Pen. The destruction of Pinnacle only helped to grow the movement as many Rastas moved into other communities, transforming into factions called mansions and spreading the word wherever they went. Howell's community was not the only one persecuted by the government and police. 
Rasta communities were continually harassed, beaten, and jailed during the 50s. In many instances, their locks were cut off. The authorities had three tools in their arsenal to deal with the so-called Rasta menace, the Vagrancy Act, the Dangerous Drugs Law, and locking them away in Bellevue Mental Hospital. Mortimer Plano was a prominent leader in Kingston. He founded the Rastafari Movement Association and the local Charter 37 of the Ethiopian World Federation. He also instigated the first universal grenation of the Rastafari, a drumming and chanting ceremony held in the slum of Bako Wall in March 1958. In 1961, after repeated harassment by the authorities and ostracization by the Christian community, Plano invited researchers from the University College of the West Indies to conduct an official study of the Rastafari movement in an effort to establish a better relationship with the wider Jamaican society. M. G. Smith, Rex Nettleford, and Roy Augier spent two weeks with their students interviewing the Trench Town Rastas. Although the study doesn't dig deeply into the history of Rastafari, it was a significant milestone for the movement. The report concluded by warning the government to stop persecuting Rastafarians because the movement is large and in a state of great unrest. Mortimer Plano and a delegation of Rastas then met with Norman Manley, who decided to give them a chance to put their dream to the test by sending a delegation to Africa to examine the possibility of repatriation. The delegation visited Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and other African countries. During the trip, Plano met Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. One of the most notorious incidents of persecution against Rastas occurred in Coral Gardens on April 12th, 1963. Following an altercation at a gas station in Montego Bay, police and military forces in Jamaica detained Rastafarians throughout the country, killing three Rastafarians and three civilians. Many Rastas were tortured. It was estimated that 150 Rastas were detained. In April 2017, Prime Minister Andrew Holness apologized to the Rastafarian community for the atrocities that came to be known as the Coral Gardens Massacre or Bad Friday. I committed to making an apology for what has come to be referred to as the Coral Gardens. One which occurred at a time in our history when our society was more reflective of the colonial era. But the larger of the far right, you see that the meek shall inherit the earth, you know? And wherever I am, I shall inherit, you know, see dreaded, so no fee no way still, you know? When the government finally extended an official invitation to His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie to visit Jamaica, thousands of Rastas streamed into Kingston several weeks before his arrival. On April 21st, 1966, the crowd went wild when the Emperor's plane landed at Kingston Airport. Rastas surged past the barriers and surrounded the airplane. Chalices were burning, banners waving, and grown men were weeping. The crowd milling around the plane was an unprecedented breach of royal protocol, which annoyed the emperor. He stayed on his plane, refusing to come down. Mortimer Plano fought his way up the steps of the plane and assured the emperor that he was not in danger. During his visit, the emperor met with 31 Rasta leaders. Each was given a gold medallion inscribed with the Lion of Judah. Selassie, who was a devout Christian, affirmed that he was not God, which only made the Rastafarians smile. Selassie's visit to Jamaica was a significant turning point for the Rastafarian movement. Despite the establishment's previous persecution, Rastas now form part of the fabric of Jamaican culture. The emergence of reggae music in the mid-60s served as an inspiration to Rastas. Through reggae, they were able to assert a social stance. In 1968, soul singer Toots Hibbert of Toots and the Maytals coined the term reggae in his song Do the Reggae. This new rhythm has a slower tempo to ska and rock steady. Despite the lack of airplay in Jamaica, it soon received widespread coverage on the international music scene. Ironically, international promoters chose the dreadlocked Rasta as the image of this emerging sound. Record producer Edward Sega, the owner of West Indies Records Limited, contributed significantly to the development of Jamaica's music industry in the 60s. 
he intended to capitalize on Jamaica's new music and develop it into an export commodity. By creating song festivals, he promoted many of Jamaica's singers. In 1972, Chris Blackwell, president of Island Records, ventured into the movie-making business. The release of the film The Harder They Come in the UK was a successful marketing campaign that brought reggae music to a broader global audience. The film marked the first time that Jamaican themes appeared in mainstream cinema. Blackwell helped to turn reggae music into an international success. Combined with the release of the film's soundtrack and the Whalers' first international record release, Catch a Fire, reggae music began to take off in a big way. In the mid-1970s, Bob Marley and the Whalers continued to spread reggae music and the Rastafarian message across the globe, making reggae a popular commodity for international tourists. By the 1980s, reggae music and Rastafari were no longer viewed as threats to Jamaica's domestic stability or national security. The captivating sounds of reggae and the image of a smiling Rastaman entice visitors worldwide to Jamaica's tourist areas with cheerful airline commercials and glossy promotional materials. The government consciously decided to exploit reggae and Rastafari, turning them into symbols of Jamaica's cultural heritage and transforming them into tourist attractions. No more fussing and fighting, not a dread. Man to live a in an upright when you sound with the children of Zion. And I say, no more war and strife. No more fighting with no cut this nor no knife. And no more war and strife, not a dread. I tell you, no more war and strife, not a dread. After the fall of Pinnacle, Leonard Howell spent the next 30 years with his small community at Tredegar Park. At the end of 1980, sensing his time was near, Leonard Howell moved into the Sheraton Hotel in Uptown Kingston. It was one of the most expensive hotels in Jamaica. There he was cared for by Miss Gertrude Campbell. Howell died peacefully on February 12, 1981. Whilst today's famous Rastas are celebrated for the music, let us not forget those that came before them. Isaac Uriah Brown, Prince Shrevington, and Marcus Garvey promoted the dignity of black people. Rasta forerunners Warrior Higgins, Robert Athley Rogers, Harrison Shakespeare Woods, and Alexander Bedward catered to the spiritual needs of the black man. Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert, Henry Archibald Dunkley, Robert Hines, and Leonard Percival Howell proclaimed Haile Selassie as a living god. With that being said, Leonard Percival Howell is regarded as the founding father of the Rastafarian movement. 